Good afternoon and welcome to the class about online misinformation. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Nicole Totten. I'm a library reference assistant up on the second floor at Leesburg Public Library. I have a few items we're gonna to cover today. Next up is our agenda, just a little bit of housekeeping. Some items we're gonna be covering today are defining misinformation, information today, cheap fakes, deep fakes, non-credible news sources, understanding bias, checking your bias, types of media bias, and some tools and resources to help you along the way. So let's dive right into it. What is misinformation? This has been a buzzy word lately, so we'll start by defining it. It's defined as incorrect or misleading information by Merriam-Webster. And it's an important notation that intention matters. Someone that's perpetuating information that is purposely incorrect or misleading information would be perpetrating disinformation. So the DIS and the MIS are not interchangeable. Is this a new technology trend? That would be a no. It's important to note that this has been around as long as mass communication has. For example, President John Adams scribbled this quote, you can see on screen in his copy of Condorcet's treatise on the outlines of a historical view and the progress of the human mind. The French philosopher and author wrote that a free press would advance knowledge and create a better informed public. Adams wrote in the margins of his copy, that there has been more new error propagated by the press in the last 10 years than in the 100 years before 1798. So that's a pretty scathing remark and it hits true for how today is. We're still dealing with miscommunication so a lot of the sentiment is the same. While the sentiment is the same, it takes a different form now. The technology we use to communicate has changed in substantial ways and new ways to communicate, connect, and receive information are changing rapidly every day. We need to understand how people are receiving that information today to understand how misinformation is spreading as well. So here we have some graphs to see how information is being received today. On the left, we see that Americans are receiving news from their digital devices, such as a smartphone, a computer, or a tablet, all these things we have at home that are handy for us to find news on in the highest percentage. Followed by television in number two, radio in third, and print publications in fourth place. On the right, you can see that they're most likely getting their news from a news website or app. Search engine being second, social media a close third, important to note, and podcasts in fourth place. So let's discuss what these findings tell us. Americans are primarily getting their information using digital devices, and they're getting their news directly from the source on a news website or an app. This is very important to know because the quality of news received is going to depend very heavily on how credible the news website being accessed is. The same can be said of those accessing informa information via search engine in the number two slot as ultimately you will be directed to a location on a site, which is gonna be a new site. So it's just the routing to a new site is the search engine piece. So wherever that website is being hosting these articles, if the website's uncredible, then you're gonna have credibility issues with the information itself too. So in all of these means, credibility is an important thing to factor in. For the over 53% of Americans getting their news from social media, the quality of information is gonna be a huge concern. And why is that? The social media sites do not vet the quality of information posted by its users. So there's no oversight on the quality of information at all, thus making it the user's responsibility to vet the quality of information you yourself post or view. The biggest perpetrators of misinformation are coming from news sources that are not credible in providing correct information and social media. To the next slide. How fast is information spreading? Here we can see a comparison of how fast information was spread in the past versus today. In 1776, it took one month for the news of the Declaration of Independence to reach London by mail. 
1858. It took 10 hours for President James Buchanan to respond to Queen Victoria in the first transatlantic telegram exchange. In 1928, it took 0.2 seconds for President Calvin Coolidge to place the first telephone call to a European leader, King Alfonso of Spain. In 2015, Barack Obama praised Pope Francis in the first US presidential tweet to a foreign leader. That happened instantaneous. So we've come a long way with the time frame it takes for information to travel. Which means if information is traveling this fast, so is misinformation. Now that we can understand how instantaneous misinformation can spread, let's take a look at some of the methods that works our way into our lives. First, we have visual misinformation called cheap scape. Cheap fix, excuse me. Cheap fix are altered media, photo video of a person's likeness using cheaper, more accessible photo or video editing tools. Most of us engage in cheap fakes using filters, Photoshop, using photo editing apps that face swap, et cetera, for entertainment purposes. This is considered largely non-harmful, non-deceptive since the editing is very obvious. You can see on screen that the cat's face was switched with a dog. So it's kind of more of an entertainment value. We're doing something for fun, to get entertainment, to share with family and friends and take a laugh at. So this isn't considered very harmful because the danger that someone's gonna misconstrue the image or think that it's real is, is very small. So there's really, no negative consequences because social media doesn't prohibit you from showing these images. In fact, it's more prevalent on social media than anywhere else. And no one's confused by it, so it really has no consequences. So it's something we engage in every day. So let's see the next one. Visual misinformation called deep fakes. Deep fakes are media, photo, video, altering one person's features using more advanced, less accessible technology. One of those such technologies is artificial neural networks to liken it to someone else's like this. Deepfakes are primarily made by companies who produce them. So what this means is it's not the everyday person at home doing this for entertainment value. These are companies that specialize in video editing and get contracted to make these videos. The interest in deepfakes is always growing. This is cutting edge technology with video editing. So the interest is always there and to find new frontiers and how we can make these images and these videos look so real despite not being the original content is always growing, which makes it a concern for us, the everyday person that may not be aware that that's growing and may not be aware that something's altered and could be mis misled by it. This is considered more harmful deceptive because it's often so hard to tell that it's not the original media and therefore may mislead. Uh, for deepfakes, one of the main concerns is it's getting so advanced now that it's almost impossible to tell without slowing down the frames and seeing if something doesn't look quite right. They usually say around the nose and mouth, really coding in on those facial features would be the only way to tell. And you know, with creating these videos and finding these tells, those video editing companies are always looking for, okay, so they can tell from the mouth that this is a fake video. So let me work on that. So they're always getting better and better and the tells are getting smaller and smaller. So it is, it is considered deceptive. And it kind of borders on, if used for the wrong purposes, it becomes disinformation. On to the next slide. So here we have an example of a deep fake to kind of illustrate the point for you. If we can play it, excuse me, let me go back. And now with former President Obama taking on fake news, except turns out it is not really President Obama in this PSA. This is a clear example of technology that could become more widely used. And ABC's David Wright is here with more. David, this video is proof that we can't believe everything that we see online. Uh, that's right, Paula. Good morning. Uh, they say that the camera never lies, but technology is advancing so fast that it can lie with greater and greater effectiveness. And that's the point of this new video. Our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Former President Barack Obama, right? So, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right. Wrong. See, I would never say these things, but someone else would. 
someone by Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele actually produced this video to warn about the future of fake news. The technology uses sophisticated artificial intelligence tools able to turn familiar faces, even presidents, into puppets. Now there is software that can be purchased and done at home, and within a few days, you can manufacture uh, what someone says in a video. Most people use it for harmless fun, like inserting Nicolas Cage into movies where he doesn't belong. But it can be scary stuff. Recently, hackers took this image of Parkland High School senior Emma Gonzalez tearing up a gun range target for Team Bo. They manipulated it to come up with a clip that appeared to show her tearing up the Constitution instead. Just the sort of nefarious use Jordan Peele and BuzzFeed, which co-produced the video, is warning about. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from you. The message here that it's getting harder and harder to trust our eyes and ears. Sure, it's, it's hard to determine the veracity. So how do we know what's legit and what's fake in terms of videos out there? All right, so that's a prime example of what a deep fake looks like and a little bit of the insight on the technology behind the scenes. So as you can tell, it was, it was very, very difficult to spot that that wasn't President Obama at the time saying that. It, the only thing that gave it away was probably the verbiage used, something how he spoke was a little bit different. It's, this is one of the problems with deepfakes. It's, it's really indistinguishable to tell sometimes. And so we need to go into you know things that we see on the internet with a little bit more skepticism than we previously did. Let's go on to the next one. What's the difference between cheap fakes and deepfakes? You can see up top, there's a face swapping. This is gonna be a cheap fake. This is what we engage in every day in social media. So this is less costly in technology, more accessible to the everyday person. And it's very easy to see it's altered. Now down below is something that I wanted to highlight with the deep fakes. And you could kind of see a little bit of that in the last video of how detailed it is. It's taking you know, your eye movement, your mouth movement, your, your features to you know, take an expression and liken it to someone else's face. So you can see here that it's taking the eye movement and mouth and trading it for someone else's. This is more costly because it's more advanced. This is less accessible because it's more advanced. And it's hard to see that it's altered. You, you know, it's, it's less distinguishable. So it's just a little highlight between the two differences. So we don't get confused on those. The next piece of misinformation I want to talk to you about today is non-credible news. The internet in general is not regulated for quality, accuracy, or any other qualifications. So ultimately, it's the responsibility of the internet user to be skeptical. And that's a little bit of what they went into the, into the video was be skeptical. Don't take everything on the internet at face value. Double check. You need to be your own detective and ask questions about the information. This has been one of the biggest recent problems with non-credible news is something is masquerading as news that is not actually news. They have a different purpose in mind, usually to garnish profit from engagement on the website, different things. You just never know. So you need to be aware that there's there could be other sites out there that are portraying themselves as something they're not. And so very much in the mind of be skeptical, please. Go over this chart on how to spot fake news. So this is from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes. So this is a, a few tips that they recommend on how to spot fake news. We'll start in the top left. We have consider the source. Click away from the story to investigate the site, its missions, and its contact info. If you can't find that information readily available, it's, it's, it's not a good sign. You need to see their mission statement. You need to say who, who, who is putting this information forth and with what agenda. We need to find that information out. So you need to search around and consider the source. Underneath is check the author. Do a quick search on the author. Are they credible? Are they real? If they're an expert in their field, you'll be able to find them in a quick Google search. If there's someone notable or reputable, you should be able to find them. You should be able to see what their qualifications are, what their education is, if, if they work in a particular department, if you're looking on the science side of it. You need to check out their background to see if, if, the, if the information they're giving you is credible. They wouldn't know something about a completely different industry with any sort of accuracy. So we need to make sure that they're an expert in their field. Check the date. Reposting old news stories doesn't mean they're relevant to current events. This is important that you don't use outdated information because not only is technology advancing at such a high rate, 
like what we see here with visual editing, but a lot of other industries too. Medicine is always advancing, science is always advancing. A, a lot of things are dependent upon technology that are advancing at very high speeds. So taking something from 10 years ago and applying it to the same environment today won't necessarily lead you to accurate information. At the very bottom, we have check your biases. Consider if your own beliefs could be affecting your judgment. We're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into biases in the next few slides, so I'll skip on to the next one. Read beyond. Headlines can be outrageous in an effort to get clicks. What's the whole story? You'll see this as you know, clickbait headlines, something with really emotive language to just grab your attention and make you angry or make you upset. And that's so you look more into it. They're going, oh, this will catch someone and get them in a mood and they'll click on this and we'll get them righteous anger. And then they might you know, look at our advertisers. They might look around our website and buy something. They're trying to grab your attention and they could be doing it in a way that's not accurate. Supporting sources. Click on those links. Determine if the information given actually supports the story. If they have sources at the bottom of the page, click on those and see if you would trust them as a reputable source. If the information they're using to base their arguments on is not credible, all the information they just gave you is not credible either. So it's important to, just because they list something doesn't make it an accurate source. So check those sources out. Is it a joke? If it's too outlandish, it might be satire. Research the site and author to be sure. Some satire sites do portray themselves as more legitimate than they actually are, just by how they're formatted, what they look like, people get misled. So it's important if it seems really strange to look into it, you're gonna, chances are you're gonna find information that shows that it's a satire site. People have been misled before and they're gonna, you know, hey, beware of this website. You'll find something in your search if you just check around. But it's important to take that extra step and check around so you're not misled into, you know, believing some nonsense that's not credible. And finally, ask the experts. Let's say you've done all the above, you're still a little lost, Ask a librarian or consult a fact checking site. There is plenty of resources available to get more information even when you're stuck and to reach out for help. So that's definitely something I suggest. All right, let's move on to the next one. Understanding bias. Let's dive into the concept of bias here. Bias is defined as prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared to another, usually in a way considered to be unfair it's important to your news literacy to really take a deep look at your own bias because everybody has one. Biases develop from as early as childhood through learned behavior. And we use them as a shortcut to make judgments, to make our lives easier. So it's natural to have biases, everybody does. Biases can be positive or negative even. For instance, you can have a bias against unhealthy food and avoid choosing cookies for dinner. That would be positive and helpful judgment on your part because it would, it would benefit your health. The negative side of bias that we really, really want to dig into here and highlight is how these biases interact with your judgments about other groups and other people. Maybe as a child, you learned to stay away from someone in particular who caused harm, and now you've applied that avoidance to a whole group of people. Biases are often based on stereotypes rather than actual knowledge of an individual circumstance. Whether positive or negative, such cognitive shortcuts can result in prejudgments that lead to rash decisions or discriminatory practices. Being mindful about bias is important because everyone has one. You as a reader have a bias in selecting the news sources you read, and the media you consume has a bias in presenting the news. If you think about it in a more smaller scale, everyone involved in media is an individual with their own bias. So it's it's at best unconscious sometimes that bias would be included due to you know, the human interaction involved in presenting that. So we're gonna deep dive into your own biases first and take a deep look at that. And then we'll get into media bias as well. So we have two sides of the coin there to look at. I'm gonna go in to types of bias. So if you're in search of objective news, you can certainly reduce the amount of bias that makes its way into your information by first checking your own and also understanding that there's different types of bias that you could be susceptible to. So that would be the, my first recommendation is take a deep look at yourself and let's see what we got. Let's see if any of these practices, any of these types of, of bias hit home for anybody and you know, take a second critical look at 
you know, is this something we want to be doing? For number one, we have confirmation bias. This is the tendency to seek out information that supports something you already believe. You remember the hits, forget the misses, which is a flaw in human reason. People pay attention to the things that matter to them and dismiss the things that don't, which can lead to what's called as the ostrich effect, which is the imagery of just sticking your head in the sand when there's something that you don't want to believe. This is something It's probably one of the more common biases you hear about. You know, people are more readily able to cue into this one. It makes sense that, you know, you want to believe what you want to believe, but that doesn't necessarily make it the truth. And I assume if you're in this class, you're looking for ways to find truth, objective news. So we need to be careful to not just tune out things that we don't want to hear and avoid things that, you know, disprove a point that you hold dear. It's, it's, it's always good to keep an open mind, guys. Two, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This refers to how people perceive a con uh, concept or event to be simplistic just because their knowledge about it may be simple or lacking. The less you know about something, the less complicated it could appear. Ultimately, people feel they grasped it completely and don't further explore a concept that there's more information to be learned because it's already been boiled down to this digestible concept where they're like, oh, I feel comfortable knowing that much and I don't dig deeper. This can also lead people to think they are smarter than they actually are though because they've reduced a complex idea to something very small and overly simplistic. So this is one to be careful about too. We don't want to assume that we know everything there is. No, we always want to be lifelong learners and dig more into these concepts that you know we're curious about. Three, we have cultural bias or implicit bias involves perceiving other cultures as being abnormal or exotic based on comparing it to our own culture. So if something's a little bit different from us, does that make it wrong? No. This bias attributes the traits and behaviors of an individual to a larger group of people, creating attitudes or stereotypes that affect decisions in an unconscious way. These can be tricky as many people are unaware of the origins of their baseline of thinking. So this harkens back to when I said, you know, when you're little, you end up linking all these things mentally based on your experience. You think, oh, this one friend was mean, so everyone like them must be mean. And when you take a deep look at how the attitudes you're holding as an adult are, you know, affecting your judgment, you can take a second look at that and be like, that hasn't been the case. That's just been, you know, a mental link that shouldn't have been there since my childhood. And that's why it's important to take a look at your biases, especially where culture and implicit bias is present because it, it, it might be affecting your judgment in an unconscious way. Four, we have in-group bias refers to how people are more likely to support or believe someone within their own social group rather than an outsider. This bias tends to remove objectivity from any sort of selection. So let's say for an instance, you're you know, hiring for a job. You wanna select your friend over maybe a more suitable candidate just because you know them better. That wouldn't necessarily be appropriate given their qualifications were lacking. So you have to be careful not to select people you find more similar to you in your beliefs in preference over others. In fact, you should really be broadening your horizons in trying to find different points of view to you know, feel comfortable in yours. All right, so number five, we have decline bias. This refers to the tendency to compare the past to the present, leading to the decision that things are getting worse or becoming worse in comparison to the past, simply because change is occurring. So for some people, they feel that change is always a negative and that's not gonna be the case. And it's important to get yourself out of the thinking that any sort of change is a negative change. Because just because, you know, like we said, with, you know, cheap fakes and deep fakes, technology is advancing and it could be a concern, but there's good uses for the technology too. It's all in how the tool is used. So we want to be careful not to think that every change is bad. Six, we have optimism or pessimism bias. This refers to how individuals are more likely to estimate a positive outcome if they're in a good mood and a negative outcome if they're in a bad mood. I feel like that was pretty self-explanatory, so we'll move on. Seven, self-serving bias is an assumption that good things happen to us when we've done all the right things, but bad things happen to us because stuff is out of our control. This bias results in a tendency to blame outside circumstances 
for bad situations rather than taking personal responsibility. So when things are going right, you take the credit. When things are going wrong, it, it's someone else's problem. Eight, information bias refers to the idea that amassing more information will aid in better decision making, even if the extra information is really irrelevant to the topic at hand. This is not the case. This is a, a, a quality or quantity situation in which you need to make appropriate decisions based on an appropriate amount of information. So you need to be careful not to fall into gathering all this data to you completely miss the point of the topic. Number nine, we have selection bias, which refers to the way individuals notice things more when something has happened to them to make us notice something more. Um, I, I felt like that was kind of a vague definition, so I'm going to go ahead and give you an example for that one. Let's say you're, you know, in the market to buy a car and you selected a specific model. Well, now when you're driving around, you happen to notice everyone that has the same car as you, even though maybe the same number of cars have always been on the road. Maybe you've passed them a million times. You just never noticed them. But now that you have that specific car too, you feel some camaraderie there. That would be a selection bias. Number 10, availability bias refers to the tendency to use the information we can quickly recall off the top of our heads when evaluating a topic or idea, even if it is not the best suited or best representation of the topic. Using this mental shortcut, we deem the information we can most easily recall as more valid than other information that may we have to look up or we have to find out more sources. In, in foregoing the extra effort you're forgoing the most valid information because maybe you've missed the point. What you can recall most easily isn't always the most useful information. So that was availability bias. We're on to fundamental attribution error. This one refers to a tendency to attribute someone's particular behaviors to existing unfounded stereotypes while attributing their own behavior to external factors. An example. You have a coworker who's running late due to traffic. When they arrive, you take a look at them and you think, hmm, they're lacking motivation, they're lazy. There's, it's, it's about them. It's about your attitudes around them rather than, oh, they had traffic, that makes sense. But when you do it, when you're late due to traffic, you're, you come from a perspective that everyone needs to recognize that it's the traffic's fault, not yours. It's not a moral failing on your part. So we need to make sure we're conscious of these judgments when we have a coworker that's running late or another situation similar. Um, you know, we expect a little bit of grace in how we're perceived, and it needs to be paid forward to others to avoid that bias. Hindsight bias is when people perceive events to be more predictable after they happen. People overestimate their ability to predict an outcome beforehand, even though with the information they had beforehand, they probably wouldn't have been able to guess the outcome. This can lead to an overconfidence in your ability to predict outcomes. This can also be called the new it all along effect. And it's particularly prevalent in discussions about sports and world affair. 13, anchoring bias refers to those who rely too heavily on the first information they receive, which is called an anchoring fact and base all the other judgments next on this one fact. For instance, you're at a store, you're shopping for a t-shirt. The first t-shirt you find, $15. You go to another store that sells it for 10, you think, oh, what a bargain. The other one was $15, that must be its true cost. Now, there could be other stores with shirts for $5 and all of those prices are relative. But because you found that one first, you think, oh, these are bargains. But in the reverse, had you found the $5 one first, you think, oh, these are all ripoffs. So it's, it's the bias that, you know, the first piece of information is most valid and from there on out, it's not as valid. So you need to always, you know, dig deeper into information without just considering the first piece only. Um, 14 is observer bias. This occurs when someone's evaluation of another person is influenced by their own biases and may assess the outcome differently depending on existing evaluations of the current subject. So to clarify this one, I also have an example. Let's, find, let's say you find out your, your favorite celebrity of all time, very talented, super outgoing, 
has a disease. Based on your attitudes around that disease, you might think, oh, they're, they're so much more talented than you thought because they're so weak from the disease, when maybe it's not affecting them in the way you thought. It's really your attitudes around someone having an illness or um, a condition affecting someone that is coloring now your perception of them. And this can be in two parts. So observer bias is also, you know, you observing someone else, but also from the point of view of someone being observed, sometimes they change their behaviors. The other side of this bias is that the subject under observation may alter their behavior if they know they're being observed. This is pretty prevalent in science related topics. Um, observer bias is a concern. So double blind studies are often implemented to overcome this. So this is just the factor of, you know, asserting your judgment around someone else's condition or a new fact about them to change your perception of them. And then also the flip side is, you know, when you're observed, do you act as unguarded as you do when you're not observed? And that's a no. So that's a common thing. So these are the 14 types of biases that you yourself might be practicing in your everyday life. And these things can go on to affect the news sources you're selecting, the news sites that you feel more, more anchored to because they're more of an in-group you know, to you than other ones. And, you know, or if you're an optimist or pessimist, you might tune into different news based on how they portray the news. So it's important to take a deep look at these and think, you know, do I have a tendency to practice some of these in my everyday life, which is leading me to select more of a, a news with a bias than I feel comfortable with? All right. So that gets me on topic to checking your own bias. So hopefully that gave you a lot of food for thought and how to kind of maybe take a, another look at some behaviors that you have and be mindful about bias and maybe be more self-aware. But let's say you've done that and you're like, I'm not, I'm not sure what I need to work on. Like, am I, do I have an input bias? Do I, do I have an implicit bias? I'm not sure. There is a test you can take, um, Harvard Implicit Association Test Online and the URL is right here. And we can see if you have any implicit associations. In, over a variety of topics, they have a, a pretty lengthy list um, of gender, age, different groups you can take, and then it'll, it'll let you know the scores on how you've rated um, whether you're objective or not. So that's definitely a resource to take a look at to check your own biases if you're not sure where to start. Because your own biases can affect how you re respond to news stories. Some people might dismiss a news story as a media bias or fake news simply because they disagree with it regardless of the story's accuracy. I wanted to share a quote with you from the News Literacy Project that I think captures this nicely. Our own perspectives, values, and beliefs may lead us to assume that bias exists, especially if we have a strong opinion about the topic being reported upon. This can result in confirmation bias, as we, as we reviewed, the tendency to quickly embrace information that affirms what we already think and feel and to unfairly dismiss or criticize information that complicates or contradicts those beliefs and perspectives. Because biases are baked into how we see and understand the world, we often fail to consider them when seeking or evaluating information. We may also perceive bias only in reporting that disagrees with our beliefs or opinions. So I shared that quote because I think it's important to take a look at how your biases are feeding into you know, your new selection as well. I know there's a, you know, a lot of buzz around the media bias as well, we'll get into that. But it's, it's kind of a twofold you need to make sure you, you're aware of in order to get objective news. And, you know, everyone has biases. It can be hard to detect when you've learned them, when you've leaned on them to make judgments for a very long time. Take the test and you'll find out. All right, so with your own biases understood, let's go into types of media bias. The News Literacy Project identifies five types of media bias. You have partisan as number one, a type of bias in which your journalist's political views affect news coverage. Number two, democratic, demographic, excuse me, a type of bias in which race, gender, ethnicity, or other factors such as culture or economic class affects news coverage. Three, corporate, a type of bias in which the business or advertising interests of a news outlet or its parent company influences how or even whether a story gets reported. Four, big story, a type of bias in which journalists' perceptions of an event or development as a major important story 
causes them to miss key details and misrepresent key facts. Five, neutrality. A type of bias in which a journalist or news outlet tries so hard to avoid appearing biased to anyone that the coverage actually misrepresents the facts. All right, so those are the, those are the kind of broad strokes of bias. We have some more specific ways we want to dig into how those things play out. So these are the big ways in which media can be biased. Um, so let's go into the details. We have bias by story selection. This occurs when a news outlet only runs stories that reflect a particular point of view. And these items can feed back into, you know, do they have a partisan bias? So are they, do they have a partisan bias and they're using that by being a bias by story selection? Are they using that as the means to perpetrate that bias? Bias by omission. A news story might present only one side of a story and omit facts and other details that support a different view. For instance, a newscaster might only interview liberal guests at a specific event instead of the whole crowd. Or a news website might only quote conservative sources and omit all the liberal sources that they used. So it's just you're omitting other details that make it seem one-sided. Bias by source selection. An article or news story might interview or reference more sources that support one view or another. So they just, all their sources were one side, so that's the only side that they knew. Bias by commission. Occurs when a news outlet or reporter passes along assumptions that tend to support one point of view or political party, such as repeating unproven conspiracy theories involving a politician. Bias by placement or layout. A news editor can promote certain stories by featuring them prominently, such as on the front page of a newspaper or banner of a website, while burying, quote unquote, not showing, other stories that reflect another point of view. For instance, television or radio stations might put their favorite stories first and then let at least favor later on in the broadcast. Bias by word choice or tone. The word choice a journalist makes or the tone a newscaster adopts can manipulate public reaction to the news story. Loaded or sensational words can elicit a positive or negative emotional response. This is in the same way that clickbait headlines are there to outrage you. They can use verbiage that has certain connotations that make you feel an emotion. And you have to be careful to look out for that. An example being that an anchor uses the word gloat to describe a polit politician's response to a story. Uh, bias by labeling occurs when positive or negative labels are assigned to one group but not another. For example, we have extreme right as a description of a subsection of conservatives, but do we have extreme left? We call that far left. So in the description, we're already putting a judgment on those groups. Labeling bias can also occur when a reporter mislabels a politically relevant person as an independent consultant or someone removed from the political sphere when they're actually politically relevant in partisan in some manner. Bias by image selection. Flattering or unflattering photographs, images, or camera angles can also influence the public's perception of a person or event. The images an editor producer selects might reflect a bias. So if they're using particularly unflattering pictures of someone in, you know, in the news coverage, you're not going to have a good feeling about them. You're going to be like, oh, you know, there's them in their pajamas. You know, they don't look professional when they could be a professional in their actual professional life. So you need to be careful what you're viewing is not affecting your judgment with someone else's image selection. So with those deep details into the nitty gritty of how media can bias things by their actions, I wanna go ahead and take a look at modern major networks and see where they're showing on a chart here next. It's important to examine closely what news sources you subscribe to. As we said previously, most Americans are getting their news directly from a news website or app. We have on screen a chart showing the spectrum of partisan bias displayed by select mainstream news sources. 
chances are your new source may be on this list. And that's worth looking at and deciding whether you're comfortable with the level of bias your news is displaying. It should be noted that this, this is an overall rating of bias on a macro level of those news sources and not a bias rating of their every individual article micro level. Ideally, you want to pick a news source with as minimal bias as possible because what we're aiming for is objectivity in our news. Free, you know, as close as we can get to as free of bias as possible, in which is the section shown in green. So in the middle here, in the top middle, you'll see the green. And this is listed as the most neutral of news sites. So it's worth taking a look at the news sites that you do check into and seeing where they fall. Because maybe if you lean more left, you want to check into a slightly leaning, leaning right news source to, you know, hopefully your news can meet in the middle or channel into more neutral, less biased news sources. We want to get a well-rounded view of the news and not just a select sample of someone's opinion in order to get the true news. So that's what we want to aim for with these. And I do have a chart on the next slide. It's a little bit easier to see because I know the last one was a little busy. So here's another chart showing partisan bias of some major news networks online, content only, with people getting their news primarily from digital devices online. This is particularly relevant because it seems like the online content is being used more regularly than any other. Ideally, you want a news source classified under center as they would be showing both sides equally or neutrally. So with all that in mind, your, you know, misinformation, uh, your biases, media bias, you know, what can we do? What can we do to make sure we're getting the news and not someone's misinformation or opinion? So let's take a look at some tools and resources we got here. And we'll use these to strengthen our news literacy. The first one is a tool that I find very, very useful. And this is Google reverse image search. It's one way to guard against some misleading uh, visual misinformation at times. What you can do here is you can go to Google Images and there is a little camera. You can click on that and you can paste an image URL or upload the actual image and Google will give you the results of where that image is on the internet. So if you're not sure the image you're seeing is the original image, one way to check is to check it against other images that are identical or similar to it on the internet and to see where those sites are. They'll pull identical, similar copies of the image and their web locations, which is an important note. Is the picture used in other reputable sources? Does the image look different on those sources compared to the one that you have? You can find the information for full instructions on how to use this feature, if you've never used it before, in the toolkit notes that I provided with the class. So this is pretty handy if you think that you have an image that has been doctored. All right. So on to the next tool. Another way to sharpen your news literacy skills is to test them. Use the website Fakey from the Center of Complex Network and System Research blog. Fakey is a web and mobile news literacy game that mixes news stories with false reports, clickbait headlines, conspiracy theories, and junk science. Players earn points by fact-checking false information and liking or sharing accurate stories. The project, led by an IU graduate student, Mihai Avram, was created to help people develop responsible social media consumption habits. This tool will help you examine where your strengths and weaknesses lie and how susceptible you are to non-credible news. So I think this is a really great tool. I tried it out myself and I found it fantastic. So I did put an example into the presentation. Hold on one moment. I'll check the time. Okay. So here we are on the example. We have we have U.S. housing starts tumble for second straight month as home buyer sentiment crashes. So we take a look at that. That sounds like a plausible. I mean, the housing market could. Doesn't sound doesn't sound extraordinary to me in an essentialized way, but it's when we get to the tagline that I start to have some concerns. Using their democratic puppets, the globalists are trying to destroy the nuclear family. That seems like pretty emotive language for me. So I hit fact checked on this one and I got this result. 
So it tells me this article comes from zerohedge.com, a questionable source. And if you're like me, you're like, I want to see that source. I want to take a look at it myself. I'm sure it's a questionable source. I'm sure that you know, Fakey knows what it's doing, but let me take a look too. So you can dig deeper onto these questions that Fakey presents you as well to sharpen your detective skills that you'll need to be skeptical about internet content. So from here, I go, let's go to the zerohedge.com website. And before I do that, I want to make sure we, we kind of recap on some of those red flags. We have them fresh in our mind when I get to the website. So for red flags of a non-credible source, we have clickbait style headlines. Does it sound too good or too bad to be true? Outrage headlines using emotive language lead to more engagement and more profit if you're doing advertising. Satire comedy sites are there to entertain, not educate. A uh, no-named author is a big one. You see that all the time with some websites that just, you know, anonymous posting is allowed. So we want to be careful. We need to be able to verify those authors to make sure the information they're being perpetuating is true. Excessive advertising space. Their business model is generating income by views and clickbait sell headlines and motive language generate more views than the truth. It often does. So keeping all that in mind, let's go on to the website. Here's what I got when I pulled up to the website. So I'll just give you a quick minute to take a good look and then I'll show you what I found. So there were, there were a lot of red flags to me, you know, just having that quick refresher in my mind, I hope you see the same. On to the next one is my notes. I have done some circling in red flags for you here. What I've got for the red flags, I've circled some strong emotive vocabulary in magenta. I've circled ad space in blue. While some ad space is not uncommon on websites, excessive space is. Sometimes it can be tricky to spot. Here in the middle, you'll see an add button and then also a play button and an X. So that'll be a little heads up that that is an ad. You can see them in a few spots. I've circled author names in red, which actually aren't author names, they are usernames. So anyone can post this website under a pseudonym username. So it makes it hard to find out if the information they're posting is credible. In the top right here, I have circled their menu. Because, you know, like I said earlier, you want to look at a source's information about their mission, about them, what are they doing, what's their agenda. Here we have a premium subscription. We have contributors, which leads to more anonymous posting when I clicked it. And a more drop down, which had their manifesto and some social media donation and advertising. So they lean heavily towards some profit generating uh, business models regarding advertising and contributors and some subscriptions. So I'm not getting a very credible news source perspective on this one. Ah, is my issue with that. So I, I would say that Fakey is right and this is a non-credible news source. Questionable, questionable, yeah. But let's say I have a source, it, I can't tell. I can't tell if it's credible or not. I can't tell if it's reputable or not. What do you do with those articles? All right, and on to next. We have some fact checking sites. So these are some popular fact checking sites. We have PolitiFact, factcheck.org, and snopes.com. These are pretty popular. Um, these are some go tos in the case that you don't have one you already trust. There are more than this. Um, I'm going to list some next on the next page that are specifically to science. Let's go to those. Okay, so, COVID 19 fact checking sites. All these sites are going to be listed in your toolkit notes. So, I'm just running through them. We have some specifically geared towards COVID-19 misinformation, which has been pretty prevalent in the past few years. And if you are, you know, a little lost because you're not a doctor, you don't have a scientific background, it can be hard to tell um, who to trust. And I would recommend fact checking and ask experts. Find a trusted physician in your life or doctor and, you know, double check everything. It doesn't hurt to double check, but it does, you know, it does, it can be harmful if you subscribe to misinformation that misleads you on how to protect yourself and loved ones and keep yourself in good health. So it's always worth a double check. And on the note of ask your experts, we have ask your local library, get in touch with a librarian. A lot of people don't tend to know this, but librarians receive a master's degree in library and information science. Information science being you know, a key word there. So they have a lot of resources at their disposal and they love to share them. And here at the Leesburg Public Library, we love to help patrons with questions. 
especially if you're curious about whether sports is reputable or not. I mean, that's, we really find it, you know, very refreshing to help people find accurate sources and participate in their journey towards news literacy. So definitely reach out. I have contact information right on screen. You'll see a phone number and an email and we're happy to help. Feel free to call in or email with any, any question. News literacy questions, we love to help with that, okay? So don't don't feel shy, ask. We, we see a fair bit. We have a technology lab upstairs and a lot of computers open for public use. So we see a fair bit of what patrons are tuning into and combating with as far as misinformation and quality information. So feel free to ask. Okay, the next one. If this topic was interesting to you and you wanna read further, there is a lot more. There's a lot more in the deep fake side of it with the technology being used there. I try to keep it simple so I didn't overwhelm everyone. Um, but here's just a few items in our catalog and our collection that you can you know check out and take a look at. We have a survival guide, an encyclopedia of misinformation, every data. It's important to be aware of the technology that's affecting your lives and you know be aware that misinformation is out there. So in wrapping up this class, I just want to thank you again for staying here and learning with me and taking the time to further your news literacy. I look forward to hearing from you guys if you have any questions and have a great day.